In this video, we'll build on what we discussed in the Introduction to Thermochemistry video in terms of heat and work. Our objectives will be to analyze the changes internal ener in internal energy in terms of heat and work, as well as to compute both heat and work. It will be helpful to remember the sign conventions discussed in the previous video, which are all based on what is occurring from the system's perspective. Let's consider calculating a change in energy if we're given information about heat and work. If a sample absorbs 196 joule, kilojoules of heat and does 105 kilojoules of work on the surroundings, how can we find the internal energy? Well, you'll want to note that the system is absorbing 196 kilojoules of heat. So that means that Q is positive 196 kilojoules. The system does 105 kilojoules of work on the surroundings. That means that work is equal to negative 105 kilojoules. Putting these together, you'll see that the internal energy change is equal to 196 kilojoules plus negative 105 kilojoules, meaning the total internal energy change is equal to 91 kilojoules. This means that um, what's occurring is that the energy change of the system or the system is increasing in internal energy. This means that when we sum heat and work, the result is that energy is being transferred from the surroundings to the system. You might be wondering, well, how can you measure Q and W? How can you measure heat and work in the first place? And that's a good question. So for work, if we're considering the so-called pressure volume work and given the change in volume, we can, uh, we can calculate the work. So specifically, work is defined as the negative external pressure times the change in volume. The change in volume is defined as the final volume minus the initial. If you use a, an external pressure in atmospheres and your volumes are reported in liters, your calculation from work will yield a unit of a liter times an atmosphere. This is equal to the energy unit of joules via the following conversion factor. Now measuring heat is a little bit more complicated. If we know the change in temperature and the substance we're studying, it is possible to calculate heat. Let's consider heating a metal pan filled with water on the stove. If you have the same uh, mass of metal in the pan and the same mass of water in the pan, which will get, which will heat up first, the metal or the water? We know from experience that the metal will heat up first, but why is that? Revisiting our definition of heat as the flow of energy between a system and surroundings based on a difference in temperature, we can measure the so or determine the so-called heat capacity. The difference in the behavior between the metal and the water in the previous example can be explained by their differing heat capacities. What the specific heat capacity is, is the amount of energy required in joules to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. The units of the specific heat capacity of uh, iron and water are shown here, joules per gram degree Celsius. For iron, it takes 0.449 joules to raise one gram by one degree Celsius. Water requires a lot more energy, 4.18 joules to raise one gram by one degree Celsius. Heat capacity is sometimes reported as the molar heat capacity, which is the amount of energy in joules to raise the temperature of one mole of a substance by one degree Celsius. The units here would be joules per mole degree Celsius. Importantly, any of these um, heat capacity values can also be reported 
as in units of Kelvin temperature. So instead of joules per gram degree C, we could measure it in joules per gram Kelvin, depending on the information given. We can use the following expressions to calculate heat if given the mass of the substance or the number of moles, its specific heat capacity or molar heat capacity, and the change in temperature. Let's look at an example. If you leave your water bottle sitting in the sun, you have a 35 gram sample of water started, which started at room temperature and you're wondering what the temperature of the water would be after it absorbs 900 joules of heat from the sun. We're given the specific heat capacity of water here in joules per gram degree Celsius. We can use this expression relating the heat to the mass of the substance, its specific heat capacity, and the change in temperature. Based on the given information, the heat is being absorbed by the system meaning that Q of the system is equal to positive 900 joules. The mass of the system being studied is the water inside the bottle, which weighs 35 grams. The specific heat capacity of the substance, water in this case, is equal to 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now the change in temperature is really important here. What we have is our initial temperature, which is 23 degrees Celsius. What we do not have is our final temperature, and that's what we're trying to find here, after the water absorbs the 900 joules of heat. Now consider, would you expect the water to get warmer or colder after it absorbs heat? It would make sense to me that the water would get warmer, meaning the final temperature should be expected to be greater than the initial temperature. If I put in these values for the variables shown in the equation, I calculated that the final temperature of the water would be equal to 29 degrees Celsius. You should check and ensure that you get the same answer. This makes sense in that the final temperature is greater than the initial temperature. Let's try a problem on your own. Pause the video and try this practice problem. Then press play when you're ready and I'll go through the answer. In this problem, it's going to be helpful to write out what we're given in terms of what we need and what we need to solve for. We need to solve for the heat required to warm this iron pan by a certain amount. We can use this expression that relates the mass of the pan, which is 500 grams, to the specific heat capacity of the pan, which is 0.449 joules per gram degree Celsius, to delta T. Now delta T, in this case, is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. The final temperature is 100 degrees Celsius and the initial temperature is 23 degrees Celsius. This allows us to calculate the units of heat in, or heat in the units of joules. Grams cancels with grams from the mass of the substance and delta T is represented in de degrees Celsius, which cancels here. This leaves us with an answer in joules. When I did this problem, I got that Q would be equal to 1.7 times 10 to the fourth joules. You'll notice this answer choice is given, but it's represented in kilojoules. So that answer is incorrect. What we need to do to convert the answer to kilojoules is divide by a thousand because we know there are a thousand joules per kilojoule. When we do this, we get 17 kilojoules. The correct answer, therefore, is choice B. Let's try a third practice problem. This one on your own also. Pause the video and try to work it out. For this problem, we're trying to identify the type of metal um, that we have. You'll notice that the metal is defined by its specific heat capacity, either in units of joules per gram C or calories per gram C. In this case, heat is reported in joules. This means that we'll want to use the first column in joules per gram degree Celsius 
to measure our metal. We have the heat transferred to the metal, which is 53.7 joules. We have the mass of the metal, 3.10 grams. We're, we're trying to find the specific heat of the metal. And we have delta T, which is that we're, we've heated the sample up by 45 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the final minus initial temperature is equal to 45 degrees Celsius. Note that we don't actually need to know the final and initial temperatures to do this calculation. When I did this calculation, I got that the specific heat capacity of the metal under study is 0 0.385, and the units are joules per gram degree Celsius. Again, it makes sense when I divide joules by grams and degree Celsius, this is the unit I would anticipate. This corresponds to this row of the table, which means our unknown metal is copper. This video has discussed the objectives, including analyzing changes in internal energy in terms of heat and work, and computing heat and work. Please be sure to do some practice problems on this concept. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.